Thank you for your kind welcome. Open your uh, Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, if you would. And uh, as you're turning there, let me just say, I was, I was eager to come to Redemption Hill Church primarily to do one thing, and that is to thank you for your partnership in the gospel with Sovereign Grace Churches, our family of churches. And I, I just don't want to say that sort of just in a broad way. I want to tell you specifically why we thank God for you. Uh, you, Redemption Hill Church, are a part of a family of churches, and your role in that family is strengthening us. As in a, as in a family, uh, a family of churches is only as strong as its individual member churches. And this is a strong local church. And we thank God for you. And some of the ways that we find that you strengthen us are, are things like this. First of all, you just planting this church um, recently, what, year and a half ago? Is that, is that, do I have timing right? About a year and a half ago. And in planting this church, being a gospel presence here in Round Rock and in Austin, uh, being a gospel witness here in this area at, with a desire not just to start a church only, which is wonderful, but to be a base from which the gospel is proclaimed and that you can reach those who don't know Christ with the good news that has transformed all of us. So thank you for, your, for being here. Thank you for your gospel presence. Thank you for your gospel witness. Uh, we, we prayed this morning earlier that not only round, uh, the, the church here in Round Rock, uh, Redemption Hill, but also our family of churches would grow in our boldness in evangelism. And so let us be bold in proclaiming Christ. Um, another, another reason that we just thank God for you as a family of churches is, is because how, uh, how you support John in working what we would say extra locally outside of your local church. So he does that in a number of ways in, his, in the region here, in, in the South Central region, but also serving on the executive committee. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a huge role. That executive committee oversees the leadership team that I lead, and it brings a wonderful accountability and check and balance in the way that we do ministry together. So thank you for supporting John and that. Those are just some of the ways that, that I thank God for you. So thank you. Uh, I could go home now and be satisfied knowing that I've thanked you. Thank you for your partnership in the gospel with Sovereign Grace. Okay, I want to read you a statement, and I want to see if you recognize this, okay? Here it is. Under the authority of God's word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Redemption Hill Church will be a gospel-centered church that worships God, loves one another, and proclaims the gospel to the world. What, what is that? You recognize that? It's your, yeah, don't look with me at blank stares. John would not be happy. That's right, that, that, is your, that is your mission statement as a church. And when I read that mission statement, it told me a lot about you as a local church. It told me that you are not only lovers of Jesus Christ and of his gospel, but it told me that you believe as a local church that God has called you to do some radical things, some world-changing th world things for Christ. It told me this as well. It told me that the heart that you have for the gospel and the heart that you have for gospel mission is the same heart that we have in our family of churches in Sovereign Grace. That could almost be the mission statement for Sovereign Grace churches. And it's important that you know that, that we share this common mission, that we share this common passion to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's important that you know that because it's clear here in the New Testament that we can do so much more together than any one church can do alone in the advancement of the gospel. In fact, I, I want to show you from Philippians chapter 1 today that it's, it's always been God's plan for churches to partner together to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, 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 I prayed for you this morning early as a church. Early this morning, I spent time praying for you. And one of my prayers is that through the, the preaching of the word and through the work of the spirit, that these verses for all of us would expand our vision and would deepen our faith for what God has called us to do together, to advance the gospel 
of Jesus Christ by planting and strengthening churches all over the world. Now, th this morning, I'm going to use this word gospel a lot. And so if you're new here, or maybe it's your first Sunday here, I want you to understand what I mean by this word gospel. This is the gospel. We believe that God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus Christ, as the light of the world, and he lived this perfect life, and he died this perfect death on a cross for my sins and for your sins, receiving the punishment that we deserved. He died on that cross. He was buried. Three days later, he rose again. He, he then ascended to heaven where Christ reigns forevermore, and one day he will come back to this earth, and he will judge the living and the dead. That is the gospel. Now, there's the response to the gospel, that those who who listen to that good news and they repent of their sin, they turn and they place their full faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. Those who call upon the name of Christ in that way, they will be saved. So when he comes back and judges the living and the, and the dead, you know that you will have eternal life with Christ. And if you're here this morning and you're, and you're not a Christian, you're not a believer, the Bible says to turn from your sin and to place your faith in Christ, that if today you will call upon his name, you'll be saved. That is the response to the gospel. So that's what I mean by the word gospel. And so let us take a look at our gospel partnership. The title of my message is Gospel Partnership, and we're going to begin reading Philippians chapter 1 in verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you all are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually served, has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become, a, has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Let's pray. Lord, I simply want to pause for a moment and echo the prayer I prayed earlier this morning. I pray for the work and the activity of the Spirit. I pray that the Spirit of God would illuminate to bring to life this, these verses that we read, not so that we would just only understand them better. I pray that it would deepen our faith. I pray that it would, would expand our vision of what we are called to do together, what we want to give our lives to, the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I, I prayed with my brothers earlier this morning here, we pray for people in this area who don't know Christ. We plead for their souls. We ask that you would rescue them as you've rescued us. Save them through the gospel of Jesus Christ as it's proclaimed here at Redemption Hill Church. Do this all for the glory of your great name, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
About a year and a half ago now, we planted a church in Nashville, Tennessee as a family of churches. A Redeeming Grace Church is led by Dave Odom, and he was sent from the, the Sovereign Grace Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. In fact, Jill and I were there in the morning that Dave and his wife and their church planning team were sent out from the Knoxville Church. It was a, it was a wonderful morning because at the end of the service, they brought the church planning team up on the stage so that we could pray for them, and there, there were 49 adults and something like 49 million kids on this church planning team. It's a lot of small kids. So hope that works out. God bless you. And so they, this, this, this church planning team moves to Nashville, the Franklin section of Nashville, and they plant this church, and they begin to reach out with the gospel. And in October, Jill and I were at Redeeming Grace Church there in Nashville to celebrate their one-year anniversary. And during our time there, I was introduced to a 19-year-old man by the name of Hunter. You see, Hunter was an unbeliever, but he came to Redemption Hill Church because he was interested in a girl. Some guys go to church for that reason. Me being one of them, actually, is part of my, my story. Well, the relationship with the girl didn't work out, but God had other plans. Because the people of Redeeming Grace Church, they got to know Hunter, they got into his life, they befriended him, they loved him, they shared the gospel with him, and at some point, over those few months, Hunter was born again. And the week after that Jill and I were there, they were baptizing Hunter as really the first convert that this church had since it had been planted. Now, I, I tell you that story because that's why we plant and strengthen churches in sovereign grace. We, we don't plant churches in sovereign grace to grow our ministry. We're not interested in being large. We, we plant churches in sovereign grace because we want to reach people like Hunter with the good news of Jesus Christ. And if we planted that church only for Hunter's sake, it was worth it. Amen? Now, I, I want to mention that because this is the context here in Philippi. Philippi was a church plant. We know that from Acts chapter 16, verses 7 through 10. See, Paul had these plans that he was originally going to go to Bithynia. But Acts tells us that the Spirit of God stopped him. And later that evening, in a dream, he hears, he sees this man that calls him to Macedonia. It's that Macedonian call that you're probably familiar with in Acts chapter 16. So Paul changes his plans. He is led by the Spirit. He goes to the region of Macedonia. It leads to the conversion of Lydia. And then he and Silas are in the city of Philippi, and they're in prison because of the gospel. And it's there in that prison through a number of miraculous events that Paul shares the gospel with this Philippian jailer and eventually his entire household. And we learn in Acts 16 that all of them come to Christ. The, the Philippian jailer and his household, his entire family are baptized and a church is planted there in Philippi. That's who he is writing to. So why did the Spirit of God send Paul to Macedonia and Philippi in particular? So that the gospel would advance, so that a church would be planted, and it would be a place where ongoing gospel ministry would occur. So the question is, why is the same Spirit of God today leading us together to plant and strengthen churches for this reason? Because the local church is the place where gospel disciples are made and it is the place where gospel mission is based. And it's clear from the text that we read here earlier just a few moments ago that this gospel mission is done in partnership with other churches as we seek to reach our communities with the good news of Jesus Christ. Did you note that partnership language in verses 3 through 5? Read those with me again. I, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Why? Why is he praying that way? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day 
until now. You see, Paul and the Philippians were, were bound together by this common commitment, this common devotion to see the gospel advance. And even though this letter was written over 1900 years ago, somewhere around 62 AD, it's that same commitment and devotion to seeing the gospel advance that defines Redemption Hill's partnership with Sovereign Grace Churches and Sovereign Grace Churches' partnership with Redemption Hill Church. Now, th this word partnership, as it's used in the Greek here, is used in the active sense. So Paul has in mind a, an active, dynamic partnership when he's, when he's writing to the Philippians. So let's take a look at three characteristics that mark a, a genuine, active gospel partnership. Here, here's the first marker of a gospel partnership. Number one, it's marked by this constant prayer. Constant prayer. Look, look at verse three with me again. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. That, that language there, always, and in every prayer of mine, it, it tells you that Paul was constantly praying for the Philippians. And did you note how he prays for them? It's very important to see that. Specifically, Paul prays, and he prays not only in a way that he thanks God for the Philippians, he prays for their spiritual growth as believers as well. Look at verse 9. And it is my prayer, now look how he prays, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and be, be pure, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Why does Paul pray for these believers' spiritual growth? Why does the leadership team of Sovereign Grace that I lead, why do we pray for Redemption Hill Church, and why in particular do we pray for your spiritual growth as believers? Here's why. Here's what we believe. We believe, verse 6, we believe that God, who has begun a good work in you, will carry it on to completion. And as God works in you, as grace changes and transforms you, as you grow in the righteousness, the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, here's what you do. You authenticate the gospel message that you declare by the way that you live your lives. That's why it's important to pray for you as believers that way. It's why Hunter continues to go back to Redemption Hill Church. Where is he going to learn how to be a Christian? It's there in that local church as the believers around them are growing in grace as the gospel changes and transforms them. I, I say all that because Redemption Hill Church, here's the reality. People like Hunter are going to be walking through your doors, more and more of them. And you will not only authenticate this gospel message that's preached here, you will begin to show them what it means to live a life that follows Christ, which in our world today is going to be more of a contrast than it ever has been for, for, before. So that is why we pray for you. And I think the most important thing that you can do as a believer in the advancement of the gospel is to do that is to grow in your love and your devotion and your obedience to Jesus Christ. So that's why we pray for you, and we will continue to pray for you. Now, can I, can I ask you to do something for us, for Sovereign Grace Churches? Would you pray for us? You see, this partnership is a two-way street. You see that Paul not only prayed for the Philippians, we see in chapter 1, verse 19, that the Philippians actually prayed for Paul. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 19 with me. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So what does he mean by that? Well, Paul is writing this, this letter from his prison cell in Rome. 
And so he hears that the Philippians are praying for his deliverance. They're praying that he would be released from prison so that he can continue the gospel work that God has called him to do. And don't you think when Paul heard that the Philippians were praying for his release from prison, don't you think that encouraged him? Don't you think that strengthened their partnership in the gospel? Of, of course it did. So prayer marks a, a genuine, constant prayer marks a genuine partnership in the gospel. It strengthens the partnership that we share together. And prayer does this. Prayer reminds us that gospel mission, it never depends upon us. It never depends upon man. Yet it is God's work in which he chooses to use man so we to collectively together, all of our family of churches, we need to be praying for God's power and God's strength and God's wisdom and God's grace to fulfill together what he's called us to do. Amen? So gospel partnership is marked by constant prayer. Okay, here's the second marker of gospel partnership that you see here in the text. Number two, rich relationship. Rich relationship. And one of the striking aspects for me as you read through these verses that sort of give you this portrait of a gospel partnership is the relational richness that it has. You see that in verses 7 and 8. And note the words that Paul chooses to use here. Verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way. He's got a heart for them. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you, I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all. With what? With the affection of Christ Jesus. Those words are intentional, aren't they? Those words capture Paul's heart for the Philippians and the Philippians for Paul. They, they shared this rich, genuine relationship with one another. In other words, this relationship that Paul had with the Philippians and the Philippians with Paul, it wasn't professional. It wasn't stodgy. It was, it was friendship. It was relational. It was marked by Christ-like affection. And by the way, uh, Paul wasn't the only man involved in this church. There were other men that were involved in serving this church as well. You see in in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, that Paul plans to send Timothy to them soon. Timothy, who they loved and appreciated as well, to help serve the church. And then later in chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 25, I believe it is, Paul tells the Philippians that he's going to send back to them Epaphroditus, a member of that church, so that he could provide additional care as well. In other words, gospel partnership, it's marked by these rich relationships, plural, where a number of people are involved in serving our local churches. I mean, hasn't that been your experience, Redemption Hill Church? The the church planning team was, was sent from Sovereign Grace Church in Gilbert. Uh, there are people here from Seguin who joined this. So Seguin has played an important role in this church as well. Uh, that, that's just a wonderful picture and portrait of the family that we are in Sovereign Grace. And, and in addition to that, there are, there are other men that have been involved in serving your church. Obviously, the, the, the pastoral team in Gilbert that sent you. And then Craig Cabanis for a time as a regional leader. And now Billy Reyes is, is the regional leader. Uh, I was asking last night, does Billy kiss you when, when you were here? And yeah, I got that kind of response. So isn't Billy one of the most loving men you've ever met? I mean, he's kind of like Paul in this regard. He would use those, those kind of words. And beyond those men, I, I would want you to know for personally from me that you are a church I do carry on my heart. You're a church I think about. You're a church that I pray for. Um, not because I'm in this role, but it really springs from the friendships I have here. Um, my friend Aaron, or we worked closely together for a couple of years. And now as I've gotten to know John over the last year and a half or two, a couple of years in particular, um, these are not professional acquaintances. These are friends. And we care for one another. 
and we do ministry together. I mean, one of my, one of my highlights as, uh, as the executive director in, the, in this role was really to watch John plant this church and to leave what was secure in Gilbert to come here and to plant this church and to watch John do that. And then to see Aaron join him. And, uh, and Aaron made a number of sacrifices in doing that. Uh, to come, to go to the PC, the pastor's college. Uh, he was telling me yesterday, look, I think my kids have moved every year. And so school's about ready to end. And they were asking, where are we going to go to school next year? What, what city are we going to be in? He's able to tell them, no, you're going to be right here. That speaks of Aaron's sacrifice for the gospel. Um, I, I tell you about all of the, the men involved. I, I, I mentioned that about John and Aaron for, for this reason these are the kind of men that I want to do gospel ministry with. These are men who are devoted to Christ. These are men who are giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. And that's who we are. That's all we are as sovereign grace. Uh, you've enjoyed that as men. Uh, I was talking with Mark and, and Kim, staying with them, and they were just talking about how a lot of the men here traveled up to Dallas back in February, I believe, was for the, for the men's conference. And what you enjoyed there, wasn't that rich relationship? It wasn't just a conference where you go and you leave. No, you, you enjoyed friendship and fellowship and relationship together. See, a gospel partnership is marked by that. It's bar- marked by rich relationship. And, th- and then to see Philip here this morning, just as a, as a part of our family, of churches and feeling your support and for him to encourage you. It's another, another picture of the rich relationships that mark our, our family uh, of churches. Uh, men. These are men and women that I want to do gospel ministry with. Uh, why am I making a big deal about these relationships? Well, it's not, not because it's in the Bible, but because it is a, it is a value that we share in sovereign grace. We wanna, we, we, because we have been led so well, in the past. Relationships are a value that we share, and it's something that we must carry in the future. I tell younger men, you better carry this relational value into the future, or after I die, I'm going to come out of my grave, and I'm going to haunt you if you don't, if you don't do that. Here's why it's important. We, it's not only biblical, it's not only scriptural, it, it affects everything we do in sovereign grace. So we've got this new polity and this new structure in sovereign grace, and it's actually the, the relational value that's really the engine that makes this polity and structure work. You see, without ri- rich relationship, polity is boring. In fact, if you have trouble sleeping, read our book of church order. It will put you to sleep. I, I think I fell asleep a few times getting through it myself, to be very, very honest with you. But with rich relationship, we, have a, we don't have this boring poly and structure. We have a defined gospel partnership that is accountable and that is mission-minded as we together, as brothers and sisters, advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, um, in, in talking about the, the importance of rich relationship. And talking about the importance of friendship that you see here in Philippians 1, let's make sure that we take Philippians 1 and we lay it into the rest of our Bibles. And here's what I mean. Relationships that we enjoy together within a community of believers, if we, even with a family of churches, they exist to serve the gospel. So we've got to get that right. If we place relationships over the gospel, we've done something we're not supposed to do with relationships. So let me illustrate that for you. The very last letter that Paul writes is 2 Timothy. And in the very last part of that last letter that he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, right near the end, he, he just pens sort of this goodbye. And in that, he mentions I think it's 19 different people. Two of them are enemies, Alexander the coppersmith and Demas. But the rest of them, 17 of them, these are rich friends. These are deep friends. These are good friends. And if you read through those verses, you find that rather than having his preference of those friends just being around Paul, He's actually deploying them in gospel mission. He's sending, he's sending Timothy there. He's leaving Tychicus in another, in another city. And if you read through that, it's just this illustration of not only the rich relationships that we enjoy, but these re- rich relationships, they, they exist to serve the gospel itself. And for those of you that have moved from Seguin or have moved from the, the Gilbert Church, you've experienced that. 
You've experienced New Testament life where you had to leave close friendships for the purpose of planting this church. So thank you, Redemption Hill Church, for providing the kind of, the kind of model, the kind of example that we need in our family of churches. Okay, third marker of gospel partnership that we see. Uh, we've got constant prayer. We've got rich relationship. Here's the third one, courageous gospel advancement. That marks a gospel partnership, courageous gospel advancement. We see that in verses 12 through 14. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Note the language there. It's advancing the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by what? By my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul's trial, Paul's difficulty, Paul's hardship, Paul's imprisonment was being used in Rome to advance the gospel, not only with the imperial guard that was guarding him, it was having an effect outside of the prison as well, where the brothers and sisters there in Rome became more confident by his trial, more confident by his imprisonment, and the effect was this. They were much more courageous. They were much more bold in declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's it's this wonderful picture that our, our trials and our difficulties and our hardships, they don't stop gospel mission. The gospel is far too powerful. Rather, we see God work through our trials and our hardship and our difficulties to advance gospel mission. That's why Paul, later in the chapter, goes on to exhort the Philippians in verse 27 to continue in the midst of difficulty to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. And then he says this to them in verse 28. Not frightened. So don't be frightened, be bold. Not frightened. Don't be frightened, be courageous. Not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but, important but, also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now I hear you still have, that I still have. So what kind of suffering is Paul talking about? What kind of conflict is he engaged in? What kind of conflict are the Philippians engaged in? It's this. When we proclaim when we share the gospel, when we advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will suffer because we will face opposition. We will face difficulty. We will face those who will oppose the gospel. Trial and opposition are not obstacles to gospel advancement. Rather, they're opportunities to courageously advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, here's why I'm telling you this. You and I as Christians, we're going to face this more and more in our culture. You know this. If you, if you track just the social issues in our country, you know this. The whole debate right now on the category of biblical sexual ethics, gender identity, homosexuality, the Supreme Court in our country right now is, is deciding and is supposed to rule in June on the issue of same-sex marriage. If you just track the, some of the social issues, you realize that more and more we are living not only in a postmodern culture, we are living more and more in a post-Christian culture than what we did years ago. I mean, I was, I was um, doing a Bible study this week. with a, I, I'm doing a Bible study right now back at my church with a group of businessmen and women in, in our church early on Thursday morning, and there was a man talking to me who is an executive for a publishing company that publishes, a, I think it's the biggest publishing company in the world that publishes medical journals and scientific journals. And their board just decided to, to, to sort of make a statement of their support of the lesbian and gay lifestyle. 
And so now he's wrestling with this as a believer. Do I continue to work with this company or not? Do I continue to be there and be sort of a gospel presence? Or is this a conscience issue for me and that I need to leave? So we're going to be facing this more and more as believers. And, And you may hear that and it may discourage you. You may hear that and it may strike some fear in you. I think we're living in a great time in redemptive history. I think we have opportunities that lie before us because as our world grows darker, our gospel light, brothers and sisters, it's going to shine even brighter as our world grows darker. So we need to be bold, as it says here. We need to be courageous in advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ together. And because of that, we're going to need each other more than we ever have. We've got to pray for one another. We've got to encourage one another. We've got to strengthen one another in the gospel partnership that we share. And so what I want to do is, as John mentioned, I just want to take some time to tell you about some of the ways that God's at work in sovereign grace. And as I share these, sort of some of these stories, the whole purpose of it all is to not only tie you into sovereign grace and strengthen the partnership that you have, the real purpose is to make you more courageous and to encourage you to be bold in the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, over the last um, about two and a half, three years, we have planted or replanted nine churches. And that is more than any other sort of two and a half year period in the history of sovereign grace. I I point that out because if you're aware of some of the, the troubles that we've walked through, some of the difficulties that we've walked through, in some of our weakest moments... We planted more churches in a two-year period than we ever had planted before. And so what does that speak of? It speaks of the power of the gospel, doesn't it? It speaks of how God uses trials to work through us and to advance gospel mission. And in our weakest moments, we can't take credit for those things. All the glory goes to God. Amen? So I just want to tell you about uh, just a few church plants and what, what is happening. Jeff Earhart planted Christ Community Church in Covington, Louisiana. He was sent from Lakeview Christian Center in, in New Orleans, Louisiana, with about 30 folks, and they planted uh, a couple of years ago there in Covington. And I want to tell you a story of what he sent me recently. He was sending me an email, and he was telling me about some of the recent conversions that are happening in, in that church. He said this, Mark, one of our our most recent, recent conversions occurred last Thursday. The men of the church met at church to discuss our study, The Godly Man's Picture. That's a book by Thomas Watson. If you haven't read it, guys, I would highly uh, commend it. He said, 10 minutes into our discussion on forgiveness. So note, that morning they're talking about forgiveness. 10 minutes into this story on forgiveness, Brad interrupted me. You see, Brad had come to our church the previous two Sundays with his family as a result of an outreach in the community he lives only two miles away from where we meet. So he's he's just new to the church. Ten minutes into the discussion, he interrupts the discussion, and he says this. He stopped and he asked for prayer because he realized and was being convicted of the hatred and the anger that he had towards his dad. He realized that he had not forgiven his father. He actually told the men that are gathered there that morning that if he drove home from that study and if he got in a car accident and if he died, he realized in that moment that he would go to hell. And so the men gathered around him and they prayed for Brad and they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with Brad. And in that moment, Brad received Christ as his Savior. He repented of his hatred and his anger towards dad, his dad, and he continues to be a part of that local church. If we planted that church for Brad alone, it was worth it. That soul being brought from darkness to light, from death to life. We we replanted a church in Arnold, Maryland, Um, Ed O'Mara uh, has led that replant. And what I mean by a replant is that this was a a church around for about 30 years that at one time was about 700 people, had dwindled down to about 20 folks, and they came to us, wonderful folks, and they said, we want to be adopted into Sovereign Grace. So we prayed with them, and we talked with them, and we said, we're not going to adopt you. 
But here's what we're going to do. We're going to replant your church. If you're open to that, which they were, which means that we take the group of folks that are there and then we take a church planning team like you've done in planning this church and we bring those folks together. And the purpose of replanting is not only to strengthen the church, but to have an outreach and a gospel focus. So I was in um, Arnold, Maryland, Annapolis, Maryland, there at the church uh, in the first week of December. And before the meeting, Ed O'Mara was telling me about three people who had been recently saved, three recent conversions. It was wonderful. So I'm preaching during the service, and on the front row, there's a, there's a woman sitting right there, and she's got a baby in her baby carriage, and throughout the sermon, she's, she's sort of verbally affirming the, the preaching. She's like, amen, and, she's, and preachers like that kind of thing, so, you know, I, I liked her auto- automatically. And so after the service, I went up to Ed, and I said, who was that woman who was so sort of, you know, excited about the preaching? And he said, Mark, that was one of the new converts that I told you about. She is just loving the Word of God. She loves the preaching of the Word. But that's not the only story, Mark, about her. Listen to this, Mark. She, she is married to a Hindu. And now we're building a relationship with her husband to try to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to this man who presently is lost in his Hindu religion. Isn't that a wonderful story of the replanting of a church and how gospel, the gospel is, is being used? I was in um, Orange County, uh, in March uh, with Eric Trebetsky and his church there, Sovereign Grace Church of, of Orange County. And after the service, much like you will be doing in this room, the, there was a man that was folding up the chairs. And I went over and I introduced myself to him. And I said, how did you hear about this church? And he said, well, I've got a neighbor who's a member of this church. And he kept talking to me about Jesus. So he wasn't a believer. And even when I wanted him to stop talking to me about Jesus, you know what he did? He kept talking to me about Jesus. So I I finally came to church with him. I hear the gospel preached, and I'm born again. So I go, and I get my mom, and I bring her to church, and she hears the preaching of the gospel, and she is born again. And just a few weeks before I I was there, this young man and his mom were baptized in that church as as recent converts of of, of Sovereign Grace Church, Orange County. So it's a wonderful picture of how we want to strengthen, go ahead and and continue to strengthen our churches. Not only there are things that are happening in in the United States, I want I want to kind of give you a, uh, some stories of what's happening globally. Uh, one of our desires is to really grow in our global mindedness as a family of churches. We've had a wonderful missiology, meaning that's a theology of mission. It's wonderful. We're not going to change our theology there, but we're trying to broaden the way that we apply our missiology and go about doing our missiology. So some stories that sort of relate to that. Uh, first of all, Rich, many of you know Rich Richardson. He is now the director of global missions on the leadership team that I lead, and he's doing a great job uh, in, in that role. I was just telling my wife that just a, a couple of days ago because he's bringing structure to what we're doing throughout the world. And uh, through Rich's leadership, we've identified sort of these three beachhead churches throughout the world where we are now forming regions. So one of them is in, uh, not too far from here, is in Juarez. And what Carlos Contreras and, and Ricky, for a time, had just built so well, have built so well. That's a strong local church there in Juarez. And, and from that church, there's a number of church plants that are occurring in, um, in Mexico. And there's at least two churches right now that are asking to be adopted into Sovereign Grace in the Mexico uh, uh, area as well. Now, um, Ricky, you may have to help me with this. So Carlos Alberto approached the team there in Juarez and wanted to plant a church um, in, in the city of Arandas. Do I have that right? Arandas? And from what Carlos tells me, this, this region of Mexico, they believe is one of the least reach re- regions in Mexico where uh, 1% of the, the people there are Christians or evangelical Christians. And so Carlos has planted a, a church there. Uh, in that city, and, uh, and, and uh, not Carlos, yeah, Carlos Alberto is, Ortiz is planning a church, and Carlos Contreras, and that, that, that team is helping him. So pray for that church plan, if you would, and the things that are uh, occurring there. Just a, a number of, that's just one story, the number of things that are happening in Mexico. All that to say, we formed this, this region in Mexico. In fact, there was a, a tweet from Carlos on my Twitter a few days ago about the first 
Mexican Regional Assembly of Elders meeting. That was really cool to see. And these men gathered together. Uh, we're, we're forming up. Rich and I were in Bristol, England in January. And a part of the reason that we were there is to talk about how do we form a region in the United Kingdom. We have one church there, Bristol, England. And so what we, what we did is we formed Sovereign Grace United Kingdom legally with the government. That's because um, as a church, a British church, they can't give money to Sovereign Grace, which is a United States-based organization. I think they're still bitter about the revolution, and we beat them, to be very, to be very honest with you. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll just play their game. So we, we, we formed Sovereign Grace United Kingdom, and money can be given to that organization, and it'll fund Sovereign Grace church planning there in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so with that, then, we formed a, a region uh, in, in the United Kingdom that most likely Nathan Smith will lead. Here's why that's important. Just two weeks ago, I got an email from a man by the name of Ray Clancy, who leads a church in Galway, Ireland. And the reason that he was emailing Nathan and I, we've known him for a couple of years, is he was formally requesting that his church in Galway be adopted into Sovereign Grace, which is amazing that Sovereign Grace would have a request like that. It's humbling and that we would potentially have a a church in Galway, Ireland. Uh, Beyond that, um, we've started a pastor's college in Germany. We have a church in Hamburg, Germany, Hamburg, Germany. And Jeff Perswell, who's our director of theology, has made five or six trips there in the last year and a half. And Jeff, in, in concert with the Ark Church there in Hamburg, is training pastors and church planners from Germany, from Russia, and the Ukraine. So after Jeff's first trip, I, I said, how are those Russian and Ukrainian guys getting along if you, if you watch the news? And they're getting along okay because they're, they're brothers in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I think there are about um, a dozen men or so who are in that pastor's college there in Germany and are being trained as church planters and as pastors as well. And then we are, we are forming a, a region uh, in, in the, in the Asia-Pacific region of the world, uh, based on, in the, the Sydney church. Dave Taylor leads Sovereign Grace Church there in Sydney, Australia. He's doing a great job in leading that church. And so there's going to be churches from South Korea and from the Philippines. We've got a couple of churches that we'll adopt in the next few months from the Philippines. It'll be a formally a part of Sovereign Grace. And so it'll be the Philippines, Australia, and South Korea for now. And they're actually gathering together in August. Here's why I'm telling you this. I want you to pray for this. In August, uh, Dave, along with Rich Richardson, are going to lead a retreat with all those pastors from all those countries that I just mentioned. And it's going to be sort of their first meeting as a, as a region. So pray that God blesses that meeting and strengthens the, the work that's, that's going on there. I mentioned that we're trying to um, broaden our methodology with our, with our missions work. And this lays into kind of the Asia-Pacific region. We had a guy in the Fredericksburg Church, his name is Fred Windelmeyer, who came to us a couple of years ago and he said, I want to plant a Sovereign Grace Church in an unreached people group in Southeast Asia. We said, okay. How do we do that? We don't know how to do that. We never quite had that kind of a a request before. So Fred went to the pastor's college uh, last year. We were able to train him theologically, but we realized that we're not able to train him as some mission organizations can in cross-cultural training and linguistic training. So to make a long story short, we've partnered with Pioneers. Many of you might be familiar with Pioneers. That's a mission organization. And they have a wonderful ecclesiology. We've, we've got a great relationship that we're building with them where they, they love the local church and they want the local church involved. So they've just had these open arms to sovereign grace and us working together with them. So what, what has happened is that Fred has been approved as a missionary for Pioneers. And he just got back from an exploratory trip with his wife, Dawn, and their two oldest children. I think they have four children, so they took their two oldest children. And they are going to be going in the next couple of years to a group of people known as the Asan people in northern Thailand. So pray for Fred as he begins to be prepared to be deployed. And if you, by the way, if you look at our mission fund Uh, We've given you giving opportunities for which you can direct your money. There's a category for unreached people group. So we want to we support people doing that kind of work. Some of that money we, we may give to Fred and Dawn as they, as they launch to go plant a church in, um, 
in the Asan area of, of northern Thailand. It's just amazing that God would allow us to, to be used that way. Let me, let me just tell you one other thing, and then, then I'll close. Um, over the last two years, the number of churches, especially here in the States, but actually throughout the world, so Galway is an example, the number of churches that have come to us and said, we, these are existing churches and want to be adopted into sovereign grace, that number has actually increased. And so they're coming to us, and, and we're saying to them, are you aware of what we've walked through the last couple of years? You know, we've had a little bit of a bumpy road, and, and here's what they say. They said, yeah, we, we are aware, and we've been watching, and we actually appreciate the way that you've walked through this, and that's why we want to be in sovereign grace. It's very humbling. Wow. So last year, we adopt, adopted three churches in 2014, Buffalo, New York, Hastings, Nebraska, and LaGrange, Georgia. We've adopted one church so far in 2015, a, a, a wonderful church in Belleville, Illinois, Crosshaven Church, led by Chris Oswald. And Belleville, Illinois, basically is a suburb of St. Louis. So uh, pray for the, the St. Louis area and gospel outreach there. And then we presently have like seven churches who are in, actively in the adoption process. So cities like Yuma, Arizona, um, a Palm Springs, California, Winona Lake, Indiana. That sounds like small town, but that's a church of 700. Uh, Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey, a church by, led by Cal, Kyle Huberts, kind of in, in South New Jersey. And then a, a, another church in, in Orange County, California. I was, as I mentioned, I was there in March, and Eric Trebetsky, the senior pastor there, has just done a great job of building with other pastors. And um, there is an Asian American pastor who's planted a church about eight miles from him. And he has really went through a theological shift. He is a reformed continuationist. He maps onto us theologically. Not only that, he just says, I really, I really identify with sovereign grace. I really identify with your, with your values. And the, so when I was in town, Eric said, do you want to meet with him? And so he said, yes, I do. And so we met with him, and we're sitting at this picnic table outside this restaurant, and the reason that he wanted to meet with us is to formally request that we would adopt his church into sovereign grace. That's a humbling moment for me personally. But if you think about that there are 19 million people in the L.A. area, what an opportunity for us to advance and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So... I tell you all those stories, and I'm leaving so many of them out. I tell you all those stories because I want you to be encouraged by what we're doing together. I, I pray that what you hear would help you to be bold and help you to be courageous with your neighbors and with your coworkers and with the people that you are building relationship with in, in your community, not only in Round Rock, but the Austin area, because I believe redemp that God is going to use Redemption Hill Church. I, I pray they encourage you that, that you are a part of family of churches that share your mission, your mission statement, to, to reach the lost, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're new here, and you might be saying, okay, I understand this partnership, but, but what is Sovereign Grace going to do for Redemption Hill Church? And if I'm you, I'm thinking, that's a, a great question. But in light of Philippians 1, let me just change your question just a little bit. I think it's better to ask, how do we strengthen one another in the gospel partnership that we share? Here's how we do that. We constantly pray for one another. We continue to build relationally together and enjoy rich relationship and encouraging one another. And we do this. We encourage each other to be courageous and bold in advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ together. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to echo what Paul does in Philippians 1. I want to pray for Redemption Hill Church. I thank, I thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you for the sacrifices they have made in planting this church. I pray that you would bless and strengthen their labors for the gospel. I pray that you would continue to help us build relationally with them. May we just have long, eternal friendships with one another. And Lord, I pray that you would help this church to be courageous, to be bold. I pray that Redemption Hill Church 
would shine the gospel bright in our increasingly dark world. And as we pray before, we, we ask that you would save many in this area through the proclamation of the gospel here in this church. Do all of that for the glory of your name, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark, thank you for serving us this morning, but really thank you for serving us every morning and every day that you work hard to serve our churches. Uh, we're very grateful to be led by someone in our family of churches that loves God as much as you do, that trusts God as much as you do, that is willing to embrace the challenge that you've embraced in leading this daunting mission. Um, what, what I'd like to do now, if we can, is as a church, I'd like us to pray for Mark. Um, as you can imagine, uh, this is a, a, an incredible role to coordinate all of those things we just heard. And uh, I'd like us just to pray that God would anoint him, continue to use him as he has. So would you just join me? Let's pray for him as he's leaving uh, today to head back home. Lord, we thank you so much for Mark Prater. We thank you for his faith. We thank you for his joy. We thank you for how you are using him in this role. We pray that you would fill him with your spirit. We pray that you would use him as he encourages churches and pastors, travels around the world to bless and encourage pastors and people just like he's done with us this morning. Uh, we pray you would use him mightily. We pray you would protect and sustain his health, Lord. Protect and sustain his soul. May his closeness in relationship with you continue to grow richer and sweeter day after day, year after year. Lord, we thank you for our partnership with him, and we want to we want to echo, Lord, our our forefathers and and uh, Lord that those who had gone before us in the faith. Lord, we want to echo and and be a praying church for our partners in the gospel. And Mark is one of those partners, so we pray for him, Lord, that you would be with him, protect him, strengthen him, establish him, use him. And then we pray for our family of churches. Lord, we, we are just a small part of this family, but we we pray for the privilege of being a church that sacrifices for your gospel, that loves the work of your gospel around the world. We pray we would not be a self-centered church, but a sacrificially loving church. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use money that we can give, resources we can give. We pray you would send church planters out of this church. You would raise up pastors in this church. You would use us to encourage brothers and sisters around the world. Lord, we ask you to use us. We say with Isaiah, here we are, Lord. We pray you would send us, send our resources, send our strength, send our people, send us, Lord, to be used for your gospel, for the glory of your name, until you return. And we trust that you will, Lord, because your gospel is unstoppable and will not cease until every one of your people calls you Lord. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Mark, thank you again for serving us, for being here this weekend. We're grateful to have you. Um, if you would like to meet Mark, he does have a couple of minutes, I think, here before he has to, we have to take him to the airport. Um, but if you'd like to just come up and say hi and greet him, I know he would appreciate that and love that. Um, for the rest of us, God be with you. Have a grace-filled week. We'll see you next Sunday.